welcome to Horrifica. If you don't already know by now, I'm your host, Colin Feltham. Tonight's movie up for review is, well, in my honest opinion, the greatest horror sequel ever put to the silver screen and the greatest horror movie of the 90s. A movie that manages to pull off what most people would consider impossible. So, the question is, how do you make a follow-up to The Exorcist? Exorcist 2, The Heretic. No, no, stop, stop it, dude. Damn you stupid fucking ass wipes. Fuck. I'm not talking about that piece of rotten dog shit. I'm talking the true follow-up. A movie almost on par with its original. Ladies and gentlemen, lady boys and ghouls, I give you. Legion, also known as Exorcist 3. Lieutenant William Kinderman and Father Dyer have remained close friends in the 15 years since the fateful events of The Exorcist. They spend their time together going to the cinema to watch old movies and reminiscing about their deceased mutual friend, Father Damien Karras, who had been killed whilst performing an exorcism on 12-year-old Reagan McNeil 15 years previous. But... Peace and quiet comes to an abrupt end in Georgetown for Kinderman when a string of murders lead Kinderman to investigate. What's more is that the killings all have the indication that the Gemini killer is at large again. But the Gemini killer was put to death 15 years prior. And to make matters more confusing, the fingerprints at every crime scene are all different from the other. Investigations lead Kinderman to a psychiatric ward there he meets Dr. Temple, who tells of a night 15 years ago when one of his patients were found wandering the streets suffering from amnesia. He was locked up, catatonic, until he became violent and claimed to be the Gemini killer. Kinderman asks to see this so-called Patient X, and when he does so, he finds no other than what appears to be his old friend, Damien Karras. So... Who is this mysterious patient X? Is it the Gemini killer? Is it Father Damien Karras? Both seem impossible and unlikely. Or is something supernatural and purely evil going on in Georgetown once more? writer of the original Exorcist novel and screenplay, first came up with the idea for a direct sequel, entitled Legion, with William Friedkin attached to direct. But when Friedkin left the project, Blatty decided to turn his screenplay into a novel of the same name, which was released in 1983. Morgan Creek Productions then bought the film rights. 
Not being able to convince Friedkin to direct, Blatty took on that duty himself. This would be only Blatty's second and last directing credit. His first outing as director would be another adaption of his own. The Ninth Configuration, another wonderful mesmerizing movie, and a spiritual sequel to The Exorcist as it features the character Captain Cutshaw, making it the second of Blatty's Faith trilogy. Check it out, I highly recommend it. One of the themes of the movie was the nature of evil and the existence of the devil. Blatty explored the concept of demonic possession in the original Exorcist movie, and in The Exorcist 3, he delved deeper into the idea of the devil as a real and tangible presence in the world. The movie also touched on the theme of redemption, as Father Dyer grappled with his own mortality and his faith in God. Blatty wanted the film title to simply be Legion. Producers, on the other hand, had other fucking ideas and were adamant on the title Exorcist 3 being used for commercial reasons. We also had another problem. In the original screenplay, novel and film which Blatty had conceived, there was no exorcism. So, producers had Blatty write and film additional scenes to squeeze one in. Knowing this now, you can't help notice that the whole storyline of Father Morning Well seems tacked on and forced. It's what weakens this near damn perfect film. Saying that, watching Blatty's vision, now available as Legion, on special editions of the Blu-ray, a patched together version of the original piece as Blatty had intended. Well, it's not perfect, the ending is somewhat flat and not very climactic and on a rare occasion. I agree that the theatrical version is slightly better, and the studio getting Jason Miller back, who was not in the original version, is welcomed. It gives the confusion of Kinderman not knowing if it truly is Damien Carras in the cell a touch more flair and ambiguity. Either way, this really is the only thing that holds this picture back from being as close of a masterpiece as the original. What truly holds this movie up is its script. The conversations between Kinderman and Dyer are great, long but real. Dialogue. Tarantino could only dream of writing. The movie leaves you on the edge of your seat throughout, with its long, drawn-out shots and disturbing scene changes, disturbing noises during scene cuts, only to mellow again, drawing you further into its twisting narrative. It's also darkly funny. Funny in a weird, uncomfortable way. It feels like the movie could fall apart at any moment, turning into a satirical farce. But it doesn't. It tiptoes dangerously between the genres, but never lets go of your senses. No murder is ever shown. We arrive late to the scene. Never seeing the aftermath, we just have it described to us in chilling detail. The killer stuffed her body with uh, other materials and sewed her back up. The other factor in this recipe for a perfect sequel is the cast. George C. Scott as Kinderman is just superb, a powerhouse of a performance. Long gone is the kind, gentle, soft-spoken Kinderman from the first movie. This guy has seen too much now. He's pissed off. His hope for mankind diminished, and he just chews up the scenery like nobody's fucking business. Was he dressed like a priest? Like a priest? Were there any signs of injuries, blood, lacerations? That would be in the file. It is not in the file! <laughs> this is a man on the verge of a fucking heart attack. And then, well, there's Brad Dourif. And fuck me. Hell, does this motherfucker put on a goddamn show? This performance is Oscar-worthy. Scary and unsettling. Hypnotic and cruel. You could believe this bastard as the Gemini killer is going to reach right through the screen and do something unspeakable to you. It's possibly one of my favorite performances of any actor. Ooh, let's call it revenge. A certain matter of an exorcism, I think, in which your friend Father Karras expels certain parties from the body of a child. Certain parties were not pleased, to say the least. To say the very least. And so my friend, the master, 
devised this pretty little scheme as a way of getting back, of creating a stumbling block, a scandal, a horror to the eyes of all men who seek faith using the body of this saintly priest as an instrument. You know my work. But the main thing is the torment of your friend, Father Karras, as he watches while I rip and cut and mutilate the innocent, his friends, and again, and again, and on and on. He is inside with us. He will never get away. His pain won't end! Exorcist 3 was released on August 17, 1990, and made $44 million at the box office on an $11 million budget. With mixed to positive reviews, it's since gained quite a cult following like me. Many consider this to be a worthy sequel to the 1973 masterpiece, but not just a great follow-up, it stands up well in its own right. A great story of the battle between good and evil, friendship, loyalty, and basically becoming a miserable old git and having to put up with other people's shit. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been Colin Feltham and you have been watching Horrifica. Good night. Yes, I believe. I believe in death. I believe in disease. I believe in injustice and inhumanity and torture and anger and hate. I believe in murder. I believe in pain. I believe in cruelty and infidelity. I believe in slime and stink and in every crawling, putrid thing, every possible ugliness and corruption, you son of